Okay, so in lecture C, I mentioned how power series were going to be how we develop a relationship between functions and special types of series. In lecture E, we showed how to take a power series and think of it as a function, i.e. we found a domain for it using the ratio test. So in this lecture, we're going to focus more on the opposite direction, i.e. we will be thinking about taking a function and establishing from it a power series. Okay, so let's take a look at the latest version of the table we've been working on. This table of representations. So looking at this, there are two reasonable questions to ask. The first would be, are these power series expansions unique, i.e. are there other ways of writing these functions as series? Two, is there a method, is there a method for taking a function and establishing a power series representation, representation or expansion, I'll use the two words interchangeably, for it at a given point. Remember we talked about different power series centered at different points. So, can we establish a power series representation for any function, or are there limitations to this? With these questions in mind, we're going to make the first definition of the lecture. Okay, so, definition. We say a function f has a power series expansion at a, a number a, if there are numbers cn, so a collection of numbers, and an r greater than zero, so some positive number, such that f of x equals sum n equals zero to infinity cn x minus a to the n for all x such that the distance between x and a is less than r. Okay, so on a number line, this looks like in the middle, this interval. I.e. F can be represented as a power series in some open interval around A, i.e. plugging X into this function gives the same output as plugging x into this series. Okay, so remark. We say that f has a power series expansion at zero if there are, again, a collection of numbers cn, all element of r, and a positive number capital R, such that f of x equals sum n equals zero to infinity cn x to the n for all x 
such that absolute value of x is less than r. Okay, so this is just a rehash of the definition with a set equal to zero. Okay, so let's look at some examples. From our table, we see that the functions f of x equals 1 over 1 minus x, g of x is ln 1 plus x, and h of x is tan inverse or arctan x. All have power series, so all have power series expansions at zero. So if you go back and look at the table and check the definition, you'll see these functions all have expansions at zero. So a reasonable question, again, we can ask, are these expansions unique? But we can also ask, can these functions be expanded around other points? So can they be expanded around 1 or 2, etc.? Okay. So we have a lot of questions, but they're all quite similar. So what I'm going to do now is write down two what I'll call fundamental questions, which should cover a lot of what we've asked. Okay, so fundamental questions. Question one. If we know that a function f has a power series expansion, at a point A, is the expansion unique? If so, can we find it? I can we establish, can we establish what the CNs have to be. Because if you think about it, the CNs are what uniquely define a power series once you specify where it's centered around, i.e. once you specify A. Okay, so second question. If we manage to find the CNs, Can we find the interval where this expansion is valid? I.e., can we find this positive number R mentioned in the definition? I.e., for what values of X do we actually have this equality? The equality being f of x equals sum n equals 0 to infinity cn x minus a to the n. Okay. So when does inputting an x on the left-hand side give the same output as inputting an x on the right-hand side? Okay. So we'll spend the remainder of the lecture trying to answer these questions. Okay, so let's take a crack at our first question. Like in the question, suppose a function f has a power series expansion 
pass a point a element of r so by definition this means there are cn so this collection of numbers cn element of r and an r greater than zero such that f of x equals sum n equals zero to infinity cn x minus a to the n for all x such that the distance between x and a is less than r. And I'm going to call this equation star. So the first thing I want to do is recall our result from lecture C, which says that as the power series above converges on this open interval, in particular, each at each point x, it converges to f of x, but that's not important at the moment. All we need for the moment is that it does converge. We have that it is infinitely differentiable. Infinite dif infinitely differentiable, as in we can differentiate as many times as we want at a. Okay. So star then tells us that f is infinitely differentiable at a. Okay, so the power series is infinitely differentiable at a. And we have this equality on this open interval between f and the power series. So that te then tells us that f is infinitely differentiable at a. And this will be very important as we proceed. OK, so let's rewrite star in the dot, dot, dot notation. So we have f of x is equal to c0 plus c1 x minus a plus c2 x minus a squared plus c3 x minus a cubed plus dot 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 okay and let's plug so let's plug x equals a into star and what do we get so on the left hand side we get f of a is equal to c0 plus c1 a minus a plus c2 a minus a squared plus c3 a minus a cubed plus dot 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 okay and now all of these terms after the first term are going to be zero because a minus a is zero so the partial sums converge to c0 so we have f of a is equal to c0 so we have solved for C0, i.e. if F has a power series expansion at A, we know what C0 has to be, i.e. C0 is unique. Now, from our remark, we can differentiate both sides of star to get a new equation, which we'll call star 1. And it says F prime X equals 1 times C1 plus 2 C2 X minus A plus 3c3 three x minus a squared, just differentiating term by term on the right, plus dot, dot, dot. And as above, we're going to plug in x minus x is equal to a. So let's plug x equals a into star 1. And we're left with f prime a is equal to 1 times c1 plus 2c2 two two a minus a plus 3c3 three three a minus a squared plus dot 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 and again the only thing that survives is the first term everything else goes to zero so we're left with one times c1 and i'm leaving the one here for a reason which will become clear shortly okay so like c0 we have now solved for c1 so it is also unique 
So let's repeat the process and differentiate star 1 to get a new equation, which we'll creatively call star 2. And it says f, prime, f double prime x is equal to 2 times 1 times c2 plus 3 times 2 times c3 x minus a plus 4 times 3 times c4 times x minus a squared. Again, I'm leaving the coefficients like this for a reason. And again, we're going to plug in x equals a. And what do we get? f double prime a equals 2 times 1 times c2 plus 3 times 2 times c3 a minus a plus 4 times 3 times c4 times a minus a squared plus dot 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 and again the only term that survives is the first term now why have i written it as 2 times 1 well i want to write that as 2 factorial times c2 bringing the 2 factorial to the left hand side we can now write c2 is equal to f double prime a over 2 factorial so again, we have solved for C2, so it is also unique. So it's a good point in the video now to pause and try and repeat these steps to solve for C3 and C4, and then try and see if you can see a pattern. Okay, so hopefully you got C3 is equal to F triple prime A over three factorial, and C4, is equal to f differentiated four times evaluated a over four factorial and you've seen the pattern which is cn is equal to f differentiated n times evaluated a over n factorial okay so that's the general formula for cn so to summarize the significance of this we will have the following remark So remark, we have shown that if f has a power series expansion, at a point, a element of r, then it is unique. Okay, So if f has a power series expansion at a point, it is unique. This is stated more explicitly as a theorem in your lecture notes on page 5, so I'd advise you to look at that. Okay, so with this remark in mind, we're going to make the following definition. If f is a function with infinitely many derivatives at a point A, then the Taylor series of F at A is the power series Tx, so we're going to represent this by Tx, and it's defined to be the sum from 0 to infinity, f differentiated n times at a over n factorial x minus a to the n, which in the dot 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 notation is f evaluated a plus f differentiated once over 1 factorial times x minus a plus f differentiated twice evaluated a over 2 factorial times x minus a squared plus dot dot dot. Okay. So if a is equal to 0, this series is known as the Maclaurin series. So Maclaurin series is just a special case of Taylor series. 
So the Maclaurin series of f, which is sum n equals 0 to infinity, f difference in n times valued at 0 instead of a over n factorial, and then just x to the n. And then the dot, dot, dot notation, that's f evaluated at 0 plus f differentiated once evaluated at 0 over 1 factorial times x plus f differentiated twice evaluated at 0 over 2 factorial x squared plus dot, dot, dot. Okay, so this is the Taylor series and the Maclaurin series of f. And again, if you read the first line of the definition, it's very important that f has infinitely many derivatives at a. Otherwise, this makes no sense, because if you look at the definition of tx, we have f differentiated n times, and n goes on to infinity. Okay? So the infinite amount of derivatives is very important. An important point in b is to say that in the previous definition we are not assuming that f has a power series expansion at a. We are only assuming that it has infinitely many derivatives at a, which is a different idea. Okay, so the, this can be quite confusing at first as there are a few subtle but very important points at play. So what I'm going to do now is try and encompass these into two remarks. So remarks one, if f has infinitely many derivatives at a point A, we can construct its Taylor series at A, which we called Tx. But in this situation, we have no information about when f of x actually equals tx. Other than at a, we don't know when these two things are equal. Second remark, if f does in fact have a power series expansion at a, so it's a big if, but if f has a power series expansion, at A, say on the interval A minus R to A plus R for some positive number R, then we must have F of X equals T of X equals some from 0 to infinity, f difference in n times, value at a over n factorial times x minus a to the n on this open interval. And this is due to the work we did answering our fundamental question 1. So, i.e., just to rephrase this, if f has a power series expansion, at a point A, that expansion must be its Taylor series at A. Okay, so the subtlety is this. Having infinitely many derivatives allows us to construct tx, but it gives us no guarantee that f of x will equal t of x on some open interval. In fact, at the end of the lecture, we will see an example where we can construct tx, but there is actually no open interval where it will agree with f. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple of examples. So we have 
find the Maclaurin series of sine x, find the Maclaurin series of cosine x, and find the Taylor expansion at one of e to the x. And in all cases, we're asked for the radius of convergence. Okay, so to find these Maclaurin series and this Taylor series, we need to find a formula for, in the case of the Maclaurin series, f differentiated n times and evaluated at zero. This will require finding some kind of pattern in the derivatives, as we can't compute every derivative individually by hand. This would, in a very literal sense, take forever. So let's try and start off with sine x and see what I mean when I say finding a pattern in the derivatives. Okay, so let's start off with the solutions. Okay, so f of x equals sine x. Now, using the formula c0 is then just we evaluate this at 0. And sine of 0 is 0. f prime x is cosine x, which tells us that c1 is cosine, evaluated at 0 over 1 factorial. Remember, cn is f differentiated n times evaluated at 0 over n factorial. So f double prime is minus sine x. So that tells us that c2 is minus sine x evaluated at 0 over 2 factorial, which is 0. f triple prime is minus cosine x, which tells us that c3 is minus cosine 0 over 3 factorial. Now, here's where the pattern kicks in. So if I was to differentiate again, what would I get? If I differentiate minus cosine, you'll notice I actually get sine. So I get back to the start, and this goes in a loop. So this would tell me that c4 is minus sine 0 over 4 factorial, which is just 0. If I go again, c5 is going to be cosine 0 over 5 factorial, which is 1 over 5 factorial. I go again down the ladder, c6 is minus sine 0 over 6 factorial, which is 0. c7 is minus cosine 0 over 7 factorial, which is just minus 1 over 7 factorial. So I keep cycling through these four derivatives. The only thing that changes is the factorial on the bottom. Every single time, I'll have either sine 0, cosine 0, or minus sine 0, or minus cosine 0. So Tx, if we look at this, we'll notice that all of the even c's are gone. We're only left with the odd ones, and they alternate in sine. So we have x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x5 over 5 factorial minus x7 over 7 factorial plus the next term would have been x to the 9 over 9 factorial, and it changes sign. Now, it's not easy to see, but you can encompass this into a formula. Minus 1 to the n, 2n plus 1 factorial, x to the 2n plus 1. And I'd like you to pause and check that this formula is correct. Just write out the terms in the dot, 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 and you'll get what we have for tx. Okay, so we were asked as well to find the radius of convergence of this. So a n here, so is minus 1 to the n, 2 n plus 1 factorial, x to the 2 n plus 1. a n plus 1 is just, well, everywhere we see an n, we plug in an n plus 1. Now, there's, there's a subtle point here in that the 2 n plus 1s will now become 2 n plus 3s. You have to be careful and think about why this is. So x to the 2 n plus 3. It's because we'll have 2 times n plus 1, so it'll be actually be 2n plus 2 plus 1. Okay, so let's look at this limit. We're using the ratio test, remember. So this is a limit. n goes to infinity, just like in the previous lecture. Minus 1 to the n plus 1, x to the 2n plus 1, or 2n plus 3, sorry, over 2n plus 3 factorial times, and we flip a n upside down. So minus 1 to the n on the bottom, x to the 2n plus 1 on the bottom, under 2n plus 1 
factorial. Now let's do some algebraic cancellations. We don't care about the minus ones, they're just going to disappear. So what are we left with? So the minus ones are gone. We have 2n plus 1 factorial cancels with 2n plus 3 factorial, and you're just left with the first two terms, which is 2n plus 3 times 2n plus 2. If you're confused about that, pause and think about it. Write the two out, and we get an x squared left on the top. So this is limit n goes to infinity x squared over 2n plus 3 times 2n plus 2. Now, for any fixed x, this is going to be 0, because the bottom is going to go to infinity. For any fixed x element of r. So no matter what you plug in to the top, you could let x be 4, 5, 67 billion, it doesn't matter. If n goes to infinity, the bottom is eventually so much larger than the top that you can make this as small as you want, it goes to 0, which is always less than 1. So we have r is equal to infinity. It'll work, it'll work for any x, so that means r is equal to infinity. If you're confused about this, go back to the previous lecture and look at the definition of radius of convergence and how we use the ratio test to compute the radius of convergence in those examples from the last lecture. Okay, so try to replicate the process I just went through for cosine x. You should get t of x is 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4 over 4 factorial minus x to the 6 over 6 factorial plus dot dot dot, which written in the summation notation is sum from 0 to infinity minus 1 to the n over 2n factorial x to the 2n. So it's very similar to sine, except it's all the even terms. And in terms of the radius of convergence, you should get that r is again equal to infinity. Okay, so in the third example, the difference is we're asked for the Taylor series expansion around a equals 1, rather than in the previous two examples where a equals 0, i.e. the Maclaurin series. But the process is exactly the same, except obviously a is 1 f of x in this case is e to the x, tx is going to be, just write down the formula, f difference at n times evaluated at now 1 over n factorial and then x minus 1 to the n. Okay, so we are tasked again with finding a formula for fn evaluated at 1, but let's look at the derivative of e. One. If we differentiate it once, we get e to the x. If we differentiate it twice, we get e to the x. If we keep differentiating, if we differentiate it as many times as we want, we still get e to the x. And this goes on. So, hence, f differentiated n times evaluated at 1 is always just e evaluated at 1, which is just e. And this is for all natural numbers, including 0. So 0, 1, 2, etc. Okay, so just plugging this into the formula now, we get sum n equals 0 to infinity e over n factorial x minus 1 to the n. And that's it. We have found the Taylor series expansion around 1 of e to the x. We'll now compute the radius of convergence which is a n equals e over n factorial x minus 1 to the n. That tells us that a n plus 1 is equal to e over n plus 1 factorial x minus 1 to the n plus 1. So let's look at the limit of their quotient. a n plus 1 over a n equals lim n goes to infinity. So e over n plus 1 factorial times x minus 1 to the n plus 1 times flip a n upside down. n factorial equals, now what cancels? The e's obviously cancel. 
and we see that we're left with one power of x minus one on the top and the n plus one factorial cancels with n factorial to just leave an n plus one on the bottom. Now, like before, for any fixed x, this is equal to zero because the bottom blows up. So if you write down what x has to be, any number you want, it doesn't matter, it'll always just go to zero. So we have it converges for any x, so r is equal to infinity again. Okay, so before we continue, please note that the radius of convergence in the previous examples is not the same as the r greater than zero mentioned in the definition of a function having a power series expansion at a. This can be very confusing as they are usually both denoted by the same letter capital R. So explicitly, what I mean is this. The Taylor series expansion at a of some function f might converge at some number x but not converge to f of x. I, in this scenario, so I, tx equals sum, n goes from 0 to infinity, f differentiate n times evaluated a over n factorial, x minus a to the n exists, but you do not have that tx is equal to f of x, so tx does not equal f of x. So this can be a very confusing point at first. So it's important to pause the video and take some time to think about this and make sure you understand what it's saying. So we will now turn our attention to the question of when does, so when does, t of x equal f of x, because that has been the goal of the lecture. We're trying to find power series expansions of f. So please note that with the information we have now acquired, this is merely a new version of our second fundamental question. And we will begin our attempt at answering this question by making some definitions. OK, definition. We define the nth Taylor polynomial of f at a to be t subscript n x equals f evaluated at a plus f differentiated once, evaluated at a, times x minus a, plus f differentiated twice, evaluated at a, over 2 factorial, x minus a squared, plus dot dot dot, up to f differentiated n times, evaluated at a, over n factorial, x minus a to the n. So this is just the first n terms in the Taylor expansion of f at a. A simple remark, tx equals lim n goes to infinity of tn x. And we can see this just from looking at the definitions of both objects. Next definition. We define the nth remainder of the Taylor series expansion of f at a to b rn x 
equals f of x minus tn x. So Rn captures the size of the difference between f of x and the nth Taylor polynomial. If this difference goes to zero as n goes to infinity, then we have agreement between f of x and t of x, which was what we were looking for. Explicitly, theorem, let f of x, tn of x, and rn x be as above. Then, if lim as n goes to infinity of r n x equals zero for all x such that absolute value of x minus a is less than r, i.e. the interval a minus r to a plus r, then f of x equals t of x on this interval. So for all x such that absolute value of x minus a is less than r. Okay, so this is what we're looking for. This is a crucial theorem. And to help us determine the size of rn in given situations, we have the following crucial inequality. So Taylor's theorem slash inequality is what this is known as. And it says if there is an m greater than zero, so some number m, such that the absolute value or size of the n plus one derivative of f evaluated at x is less than or equal to m for all x that are some number d away from a, then the nth remainder, rnx, satisfies the inequality absolute value of rnx is less than or equal to m over n plus 1 factorial times x minus a to the n plus 1 for all x that are this d away from a. Okay, so this may look a bit technical at first, but it will prove to be crucial when dealing with concrete examples and trying to find where expansions are valid. So let's look at an example to see how this is used. Okay, so example. If f of x is equal to sine x, then, for any n natural number, the n plus 1 derivative of f at x is either sine x, cosine x, minus sine x, or minus cosine x. Remember, the derivatives of sine just cycle through these four functions. In any of these cases, these functions are all bounded above by 1 for any value of x. So the n plus 1 derivative of f evaluated at x is always less than or equal to 1 for all x element of r. Hence, by Taylor's theorem, or Taylor's inequality, the absolute value of rnx is less than or equal to 1 over n plus 1 factorial. 1 here is playing the role of the capital N times absolute value of x to n plus 1 for all x element of r. Hence, for any x element of r, the limit as n goes to infinity 
of the size of R and X is less than or equal to the limit, as n goes to infinity, of absolute value of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial, which, from the last lecture, is equal to 0. This is from last lecture. Okay, so if, if the absolute value of r and x goes to 0, then r and x goes to 0. And then hence, by the previous theorem, hence by the previous theorem, sin x is equal to its Taylor expansion at zero, its Maclaurin series, for all x element of r, i.e. sin x is equal to sum n goes from zero to infinity minus one to the n over 2n plus one factorial x to the 2n plus one for all x element of r. So we have found a power series expansion for sine x which is valid on the entire real line. So we've achieved our goal in the case of sine x for finding where it can be expanded in a power series. So now is a good point to pause the video and try and imitate this process for cosine x and you should get a very similar result. Okay so we're asked in this example to find the sum of the given series. Now it looks pretty daunting on the surface, but let's try and use what we've come up with so far in the lecture. So we have for all x element of r, sine x is equal to sum n equals zero to infinity minus one to the n over two n plus one factorial times x to the 2n plus 1. Okay, So let's have a crack at rewriting the series we were given, which was minus 1 to the n, pi to the 2n plus 1, divided by 2 to the 2n plus 1, times 2n plus 1 factorial. Rearranging this, so I'm not going to do anything, I'm not going to change anything. I'm just going to rewrite what I'm given for the terms, bringing the 2n plus 1 factorial under the minus 1 to the n, pi to the 2n plus 1 over 2 to the 2n plus 1. Now, the pi and the 2 are both to the same power, so I can bring them inside the 1 power. So minus 1 to the n over 2n plus 1 factorial, pi over 2, to the 2n plus 1. Now, this equals, if I call the above equality star, if we stare at this, we can see that the sum we have now actually just equals sine of pi over 2. It's exactly the same as the equality above, except instead of an x, we have a pi over 2. And sine of pi over 2 is 1. So, this is a very useful application of Taylor series. If you were to look at the series above, and try to compute the limit just based off the partial sums, trying to find patterns in partial sums, that would be absolute hell. So Taylor series has been very useful in just simplifying this argument greatly, and we find that the limit we were looking for is just one. Okay, so the next example asks us to use power series to find the limit cosine x to the 5 minus 1 over x to the power of 10. Now, you may be tempted to use L'Hopital's rule, but you'll find that if you try to do this, you'll have to differentiate top and bottom 10 times, which would be very encumbersome. So let's try and use the tools we developed instead. Recall, so this is one of the things I asked you to prove, cosine w is 1 minus w squared over 2 factorial plus w to the 4 over 4 factorial minus w to the 6 over 6 factorial and it continues on in this pattern. Now originally I had x instead of w but again it doesn't matter what I call the letter. So hence cosine x to the 5 so if when it was w I put a w everywhere so when it's x to the 5, I just replace all the w's with x to the 5's. 
So 1 minus x to the 5 squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 5 to the 4 over 4 factorial minus x to the 5 to the 6 over 6 factorial plus dot dot dot. Again, I'm just replacing the w's with x's to the 5. So this tells me that if I take away the 1, I kill the first 1. I'm just left with x to the 5, x to the 5 to the power of 2 is just x to the 10. So let's multiply all, out all the powers. And we're left with this plus dot, dot, dot. Now, if I divide across by x to the power of 10, I can see that in the first term, I'm just going to be left with minus 1 over 2 factorial plus x to the 10 over 4 factorial plus x to the 20 over 6 factorial plus dot, 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 higher powers of x. So hence, the limit I was asked to find x goes to 0 of cosine x to the 5 minus 1 over x to the 10. Now, the first term isn't going to care what happens to x because it's just minus 1 over 2 factorial. It doesn't change. But if I look at this term, this is going to go to 0 if x goes to 0. This term will also go to 0. All of the higher powers of x will all go to 0. And the only thing that survives is the minus 1 over 2 factorial which is just minus one half. So again, we have used Taylor series and Taylor expansions to simplify greatly a certain computation. This limit we're using in L'Hopital would have been very difficult, but with Taylor series, it proved to be quite simple. Okay, so there are many more examples in your notes, in particular the examples concerning binomial expansions, but I'm going to omit these in the interest of keeping this lecture under an hour. You should take a look at these examples and make sure you understand them, though. If you're having difficulty with them, please contact your instructor. Okay, so lastly, I promised I would show an example of how strange Taylor expansions can be. So to this end, consider the following example. f of x is equal to e to the minus 1 over x squared for all non-zero x, and it's 0 at x equals 0. So we have a piecewise defined function, which looks like this. And it can be shown. So if you want to pause the video and look at the graph, but it can be shown that f differentiated n times evaluated at 0 is always 0. So no matter how many derivatives you take, if you evaluate at 0, you get 0. Hence, the Maclaurin series of f at 0, so Maclaurin series, is f to the n evaluated at 0 over n factorial x to the n is just the sum of 0, which is 0. But f of x only equals 0 at 0. If you look at the graph, other than at the origin, it is always at a positive height. Hence, f of x equals t of x only at x equals 0. Hence, t of x exists for all x. It's always 0. t of x is always 0 for any x. But there is no open interval where f of x equals t of x. Okay, so this is a very strange example when you first see it, but what we have done is we have taken the function f, we have established its Maclaurin series. Its Maclaurin series for any x is equal to 0. So the Maclaurin series is always 0, but f is only 0 at the origin. So f only agrees with its own Maclaurin series at the origin. And that's what's very strange about this example.